Welcome to Hot Chips 24. Session 9. Big Iron. Welcome back to the last session of this hot chips. We have saved the most exciting stuff for the end. So, independent of how uh, I'm Pradeep uh, Dubey from Intel. So, independent of how uh, the market share and who has how what fraction of market share, there's no shortage of architectural innovation, especially in the server space. So, if you liked ARM, uh, you'd love what Spark has to offer, and if you liked Power Seven, wait till you hear the next one. So that's the, that's the reason why we are here. It's a fun conference. So our uh, uh, first speaker in this session is uh, Takomi Maruyama from Fujitsu. Takomi Mar Maruyama is Assistant VP of uh, Processor Development Division at, um, at Fujitsu in the Enterprise Server Business Unit. He started working on the first Spark 64 processor designed in 1993 and has been involved with the development of Spark 64, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, all these processes, right? All the way, and, and now, the very latest one that earned the first prize in Top 500, the K-Machine one, in 2011. He holds a BE in mathematical, in mechanical, in mathematical engineering. Is that right, is that a typo? No. Mathematical engineering and instrumentation physics from the University of Tokyo. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. <laughs> good, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Takumi Mariyama from Fujitsu. I'm going to introduce Fujitsu's new generation 16 core processor for the next generation Unix service. The name of the processor is Spark 6410. First, I'm going to show you the uh, process, uh, this is processor development history shortly. After that, I'm going to present Spark 4 processor, 10 processor itself. Its design concept, its software on chip functionality, processor chip overview, and microarchitecture, and performance. First, let me uh, talk about uh, this is processor development history. Spark 64 is the name of the processor series Fujitsu de develops for long for Unix servers and supercomputers. Uh, Spark 64, uh, 6 and 7 were used in Spark Enterprise Unix servers sold by Fujitsu and Oracle. And Spark 64 8 FX, I introduced this chip three years ago at the, these hot, hot chips. And this chip was designed for the supercomputer K. And as you know, that supercomputer K was proven to be the world's fastest, uh, fastest last year. My team were very proud about this. And this time, I'm going to uh, explain about the Spark 410. We have newly designed for our next generation Unix service. Okay, first, I, I'm going to talk about the design concept for this processor. The, we, the target of this processor is to, is to combine Unix and HPC processor features to realize an extremely high throughput Unix processor. Spark 47 Plus, which is a Unix, uh, Unix uh, processor, runs with a high CPU frequency uh, up to 3 GHz, multi core and multi threaded design to increase throughput, and multi-socket uh, multi capability up to 64 sockets. On the other hand, Spark 64-8FX, which is a, a, a supercomputer processor, has innovative instruction set architecture called HPC-8. And also, it has 
high memory bandwidth of 64 gigabytes per second to meet the supercomputer's requirement. Spark 6410 combines these Unix and HPC processor features. In addition, we have added new features vital to, uh, vital to the contemporary Unix servers, such as virtual machine architecture, software on chip, which I, I'm going to explain at the next slide, embedded uh, PCI Gen 3 controller, and direct CPU to CPU interconnect. The notion of software on chip is very simple. Hardware designed for software. In other words, hardware which accelerates specific, uh, specific software functions. For Spark 6410, such software uh, functions are, first, uh, decimal operations, second, cipher, cipher operations, such as AES and DES, and database acceleration. From hardware point of view, we have implemented this software on chip engine as a part of the floating point unit within each core, rather than the dedicated coprocessor. This is to fully utilize large floating point registers. Also, we have implemented the various instructions to utilize this software on chip engine. When we are adding these instructions, we made sure that to keep the philosophy of risk to avoid comp uh, complication. So we, as a total, we have added 18 instructions for decimal operations and 10 instructions for cipher operations. Let me talk about more about the decimal operation instructions that we have added. The instructions uh, support two types of the uh, decimal data. One is the IEEE 754 de uh, density packed decimal, which has an 8 byte fixed length. The other one is the Oracle number, which has a variable length up to 21 bytes. But for the, for the instruction point of view, both of the DPD and number instructions are defined as an 8 byte operation. Operation means such as decimal add or decimal sub, something, something like that on floating point registers. This is to minimize, uh, sorry, not to minimize, maximize, apparently, uh, to maximize performance with reasonable hardware cost. If the, the data is bigger than eight bytes, multiple such instructions will be used. Also, an instruction for special byte shift on floating point register has been added to handle the unaligned number data. Using this data, we can extract the, any contiguous 8-byte data from the 16-byte data stored in the two floating point registers. Here is a die photo of the Spark 410. As you see, the chip includes 16 cores. Each, uh, each core is able to run two threads. And in here, we have a 24 megabyte reverse cache. They are all shared between, uh, between the 16 cores. And also, the chip includes uh, the, the memory controllers in here, where the chips are connected to the DDR3DM directory, where the uh, peak memory bandwidth is over 100 gigabytes per second. Also, chip includes the, the, the PCI Gen 3 I.O. controller in here. And also, chip includes the service for the inter, uh, in, <coughs> interconnect of CPUs. I'm going to explain about uh, this later. Chip is fabricated with 28 nanometer CMOS technology. And the chip size is 23.5 millimeter by tw uh, 25 millimeter. In your slide, it says uh, 23, but the 25 is the, cor uh, the correct one. Sorry about that. And the chip has almost 2.9 billion transistors, and uh, it runs as fast as 3 gigahertz. Performance of the chip is uh, 288 GIPS, or 382 gigaflops. 
This is the, the detail of the processor core. The processor core's architecture is based on the Spark V9, JPS, and HPS, as I mentioned. And it has a virtual machine architecture and the supports the software on chip functionality. In the instruction control unit, we do have a branch prediction and a kind of 4K branch history and 16K pattern history table. In the uh, integer execution unit, we have a two LU shifter and a two agent. And this has been enhanced to, uh, to execute the simple integer ex ex execution as well. So each core is capable, uh, has four integer LUs. And for the floating point side, we have a four FMA and two floating divide in it. And also, I'd like to mention that this floating point unit can handle the simple integer operations as well, such as uh, integer multiply art or logic operations. We, uh, we have four of them. And L1 I cache and L1 D cache, both are 64K, 4K byte and four way, set sensitive. And what has been changed from the current generations from of the Spark 7 Plus? We have increased the number of the, the uh, pipeline stage, and we have adapted beta branch prediction scheme. Various queue size has been increased, and we have enhanced the execution unit largely. And the, also, we have enhanced the, the load star unit as well. I'm going to explain about this later. Other than the, the, the core, the, we have increased the number of the core and uh, LC cache size. Also, memory controller, I/O controller, and the CPU CPU interface are all embedded to increase performance and reduce cost. Now, let me talk about the pipeline of the chip. This is a pipeline of the current processor, Spark 47 Plus. And then let me show you the, the one of the, the Spark 10. It's very similar. Let me go back like this, like this. So basically, the microarchitecture is very similar, but there are some difference. Basically, there's a red, uh, yes, say, yellow portion is the one that they enhanced at the, the Spark 8 effects, and the red portion is a completely new, uh, new one. Let me start from the, the, the fetch, uh, starting from the fetch stage. In the fetch stage, we have added the, the pattern history table to the improve the branch prediction accuracy. And for the issue and the, the register user stage, we have added the increased number of those stages. And for the disp dispatch stage, as you can see, we have increased the number of the reservation stations to increase IPC. And the execution engine point of view, we have increased the number of the, the architecture registers as well as the name registers. And also, the number of the integer execution unit has been increased from two to four, and the number of the floating point unit has been uh, increased from two to four, and this floating point is able to handle decimal operations or cipher operations, as I mentioned. And we have increased a lot of the, the, the queue size, the, which we call fetch photo storeboard or light buffer which basically keep, uh, keeps track of a lot of instructions. And other than the core itself, the number of the core has been increased to 16, and the cache size has been increased, Men memory controller is embedded and directly connected to the DAM, and IO controller is uh, embedded, and uh, CPU, CPU interface has been embedded. Let me talk about more about uh, the, the detail of the execution enhancements. First, as I mentioned, that uh, the Spark 7 Plus has uh, two uh, ALUs and two other generation in it. But in the, for the Spark 10, this other generation unit can be used as a, the ALU. So that, uh, that means uh, Spark 10 ha, uh, 10's core has four ALU, four integer ALU. And to support this uh, four ALU, we have increased the number of the, the right port to the rename register, as well as the architecture register. So as a result, four integer instruction can be executed per cycle as a sustainable rate. We have increased the load strength as well. 
we have adapted, adapted more aggressive load storage scheme. Unlike the current generation, the, this chip is able to execute load without, without waiting for the pre, uh, preceding store address calculation. Also, we have adapted multi-banked two-port level one cache to execute two 16-byte load or one 16-byte load plus one 16-byte store in parallel. We double the L1 cache associativity. So these, these enhancements is necessary to in increase L1 cache throughput and cache hit rate. I'm going to tell you about the, what the performance the improvement is going to be for this microarchitecture enhancements. Not only the chip inside, the, the, the system configuration, interchip inter -chip connection has been improved. This is the, the CPU interconnect of the current generation. Spark 7 Plus is connected to DDR2 DIMM through the two additional LSIs called AC and Mac. Memory throughput per CPU is the 4.35 gigabyte per second with stream triad. On the other hand, for the Spark 10, each chip is connected to DDR3 DIMM directory and without uh, additional LSIs. And uh, memory, its memory throughput is 65.6 gigabytes per second with st stream triad. This is measured value. And uh, also, chip has five CPU-CPU uh, five interface. Three of them are used to configure the four-way glueless uh, uh, configuration. And the remaining two are used uh, to for the, the bigger configuration. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about more about the, the, this CPU-CPU uh, inter, uh, in, interconnect uh, the circuit. Basically, the, the, the each port uh, consists of 14.5 giga uh, bit per second by eight lanes by, di by directional service, service interface. This is a photo of, uh, photo of uh, service. An embedded uh, uh, equalizer circuit enable long distance signal transmission. And also, uh, chip includes a two PCI Gen3 port. As a total, built in service provides peak 88.5 gigabytes per second throughput. Let me talk about the last of this uh, processor Spark 10 has the main mainframe class loss features as the current uh, processor does. This, this table summarizes them. Both the tag and data of the cache are e either ECC protected or duplicated. Both integer and floating point registers are ECC protected. ALUs, ALUs are parity protected or residue protected. And we do have a uh, cache dynamic degradation capability and hardware instruction literal, which I'm going to explain later and in the next slide. And we do have a history, which uh, is like a flight recorder. Uh, when the era hardware error is detected, the, the history RAM keeps track of what's going on. This diagram shows the ECC of the chip. As you can see, most of the portions are marked green. That means that if even if the one-bit error is detected in the green area, this error can be collect, uh, is collectable. The remaining yellow is one-bit error detectable, and uh, uh, gray portion is one-bit error harmless. So the number of the, the checker, error checkers has been uh, increased to almost over uh, 50,000 to identify failure, more, uh, failure point more precisely. Spark 3410 guarantees data integrity through its Rust capability. Okay. And how do you about the hardware instruction retry? Basic mechanism is simple. When the hardware error is detected, the, the core is going to, uh, will flush the, all the in-flight instructions. Then the single step executes the instruction alone. And once it turns out it gets executed successfully, then we, the, the chip is going to go back to the normal mode. But uh, do, 
using this mechanism, we, uh, the hardware can auto, auto, automatically remove the transient error. OK, now let me talk about the performance of the chip. And this is uh, the performance uh, of the chip relative to the current Spark T47 Plus. This portion indicates the uh, single thread performance, and this portion indicates the chip throughput. As you see, the chip throughput of Spark T410 is about seven times of the current Spark T47 Plus. Please note that this result is uh, based on the current the unmodified compiler of JVM. I expect that the result is going to be better once the compiler JVM is tuned for this chip. Memory throughput is 15 times, as I mentioned. And uh, for the software chip functionality, you can see number is almost eight times, and uh, Encryption of the AES is uh, uh, en encryption decryption of the AES is uh, 1980x times, and uh, uh, please note again that this number result is based on the scalar data. We expect that uh, the result is going to be much much better for the, for the vector. Then uh, in the next slide, I'm going to talk about the detail of the this in uh, integer single thread performance increase. And this is a busy slide. But basically, this, uh, this graph shows the uh, cycle per instruction of Spark 247 plus and uh, Spark 2410. Basically, left bar shows the, the one of Spark 247 plus, and right bar shows Spark 2410 for each test. Please note that uh, this is a CPI graph. So that means that long, long bar means the lower performance. When you see the bottom of the, the each, each bar, you can see that uh, almost all of the, 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 this blue portion incre uh, gets increased. This portion in, uh, sh uh, shows how many times, uh, how many cycles are used for the four commit. So that means that uh, the four integer execution units increase the performance overall. Also, for the store time point of view, you can see the orange one, which is the memory store, and you can see the light blue, um, light blue one for the cache store, and the purple one for the core store. All of them are, are decreased dramatically uh, from the Spark 7 Plus to Spark 10, thanks to the memory latency reduction due to embedded memory controller, large, uh, and large level two cache, beta branch prediction scheme, and L1 cache improvement. Okay, let me summarize my presentation. Spark 6410 is Fujitsu's 10th Spark processor, which has been designed to be used for Fujitsu's next generation Unix service. Spark 6410 integrates 16 cores and 24 megabyte level 3 cache with over 100 gigabyte peak, uh, peak memory throughput. Spark 6410 keeps strong glass features. Uh, Spark 6410 chip is up and running in the lab. The graph I showed you the, the, was all the, the hardware measured results. And also, I brought the chip itself in here, although I, I don't think that you can see from, from the seat. And the chip has shown seven times throughput of the, the current Spark 7 Plus without compiler training. Software chip features effective to accelerate specific software functions. And at last, the Fujitsu is committed to design the Spark, uh, Spark processor. Fujitsu will continue to develop uh, Spark 2.4 uh, processor series in the future. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, Satoshi Matsushita, do you see? Uh, how much is the TDP of this power dissipation of this <laughs> processor? I'm quite curious about which is the world's hottest processor in the, uh, hottest processor in the world. <laughs> well, I cannot mention the exact power number. This is because, as you know, to, to get the exact number, the power is a the, depending on the various things, such as process variation and voltage, 
and we haven't, we are not ready to announce the, the uh, absolute value. But to be frank, the chip is very hot. So it's, <laughs> it's good for the, the hot chips. But also, <laughs> but That's so it's here, hot chips. Yeah. <laughs> That's the reason I came here. And, uh, also, I want, to mention, uh, I want to mention that I said that uh, the chip throughput is over seven times compared to the, the previous generation. So at least uh, from the, the performance per watt point of view, it is greatly improved. Let me ask one more question. Mm -hmm. um, how often the ECCLR correction on the data bus is detected, or the, the, how useful it, it is, is it? that if it, it happens so quiet uh, often that it might be a reason my PC hangs so frequently. Now, if, if you are using your PC, it's okay, you can uh, push the reset button, or you have, you have to do it like, like that, right? But I, we are designing the server chip, so it's quite different. And uh, I don't have the, 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 the how to say it. The, the concrete number that how useful it, uh, the, the, this, the last functionality it is. But uh, we made a kind of the experiment before by the, the, how to say, putting the neutron beam to our the, 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 to processor to, and to check that how the, our the processor last functionality works well. And uh, the result was quite, uh, the result was quite, shows the, our last feature is quite effective. Thank you. Next question. Oh. Andreas Moskovos, University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. Can you comment a little bit more on uh, what kind of hardware acceleration you put for databases? Well, <laughs> this is an another thing. Uh, how to say? We have added some of the basic function to the floating point unit to accelerate the database, such as uh, the the, the, to search for the, for example, the, the, the instruction to help to search the particular data or something like that. But um, I, I'm a little, little bit reluctant to say about more details about this. Sorry about that. Uh, Mustafa Al-Khouli, Cell Mines. I have a couple of questions regarding the decimal floating point hardware accelerator. Mm -hmm. The first one you mentioned that it's, it implements the DPD functions mm -hmm. over the binary hardware. Or you, you have a, a dedicated hardware for implementing the DPD uh, operation? Yeah, basically we had a, a dedicated hardware to uh, handle the DPD functionality, yes. Okay, the second question, what kind of uh, functions, I mean addition, multiplication, subtraction, do you support for the DPD? No, uh, say again? I don't what, what are the types of functions do you support in oh, hardware? Oh, yeah. Basically, as I wrote in my, uh, see, in my slide, basically add the self, multiply, divide, and compare. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Last question. Uh, Bill Rash, Intel. You, you mentioned uh, supporting Linux and uh, Unix, so I'm wondering if uh, Fujitsu will be offering Solaris to run on the Spark well, 64X. Well, well, well. What I meant to say Unix is, of course, the, about the Solaris. And uh, as far as know, the, the most of the our Spark 64 processor supports uh, the Solaris rather than the Linux. The, 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 except the, the, the ones designed for the supercomputers. And this, this, of course, this processor is going to be used for the, the Solaris machine. It will be used for Solaris. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Let's thank our speaker. <laughs> so next, we have if you saw ARM excitement, don't forget Spark was equally exciting when it was launched. And it still is. To prove that, we have two speakers who would talk about Spark and uh, from Oracle this time. And the first, uh, Sebastian Trollis has worked in Silicon Valley since uh, his bachelor's and master's degrees from Stanford. He joined Sun Micros um, with the acquisition of Kylia in 2004. And uh, he uh, is also um, his co-speaker uh, is, is his friend since the first Spark microprocessor days. And uh, the, uh, subsequently, uh, Sebastian has contributed to the success of T-series processors beyond T5. He manages R&D 
group at Oracle uh, responsible for processor design and verification. His colleague who's joining him, Ram Sivaramakrishnan, is, uh, he joined Sun in 1996 and then went to Afra, Af Afara Web Systems and he returned to Sun through the acquisition of Afara in 2002. And Ram has a bachelor's degree, uh, bachelor's degree from National Institute of Technology in Warangal and MS from University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So let's welcome Sebastian. Thank you very much, Pradeep. Ram and I are delighted to be here presenting for the first time publicly the Oracle Spark T5 microprocessor. Today, I'll be going over the design objectives we set out to achieve with the processor, an overview of the microprocessor, and then a recap of Core S3, at which point I'll hand over the mic to Ram, who will describe our cache hierarchy and internode coherency architecture. Finally, I'll wrap up the presentation with a discussion of our advanced power management features and PCI Express Gen 3 I.O. subsystem. With T5, we set out to multiply the customer visible performance of our systems, single-threaded, multi-threaded, and multi-socket. Specifically with regard to multi-socket performance, we wanted to increase our scaling from four sockets glueless to eight sockets glueless and do so extremely efficiently. There are eight socket systems on the market that you can buy that actually only deliver the equivalent performance of perhaps five single sockets um, on, on many workloads. And there are good reasons for that. You know, one, it's a hard problem to solve. Ram's going to be talking about some of the things we did in that regard. And two, you know, maybe they're optimizing for four sockets and not so much for eight sockets. So with T5, we really wanted to offer a very close to linear scaling from one to eight sockets. Another important objective for us was to optimize for Oracle workloads and Oracle engineered systems. If you're not familiar with um, Oracle engineered systems, these are vertically integrated solutions that combine Oracle hardware with Oracle software applications to deliver easy to purchase, easy to deploy um, applications. And a key important uh, performance feature for those is cluster performance because they typically um, cluster multiple systems. So, there are a lot of features that we talk about today that go specifically towards accelerating clustered performance. Another important objective for us was to maximize power efficiency. Um, we recognize that ongoing operating costs are, in many cases, as important, if not more important, than upfront purchasing costs, and uh, power consumption plays a big, big role in that. Uh, finally, with T5, we sought to extend our enterprise class uh, reliability, availability, and service. You're looking at a di micrograph of T5, which shows our 16 S3 cores uh, located in four quadrants of the chip. Each core runs at 3.6 gigahertz. Uh, they communicate via a central crossbar switch to eight megabytes of L3 cache divided into eight banks. We have four memory control units that collectively uh, have been measured to deliver a stream read plus write bandwidth of 80 gigabytes per second. Um, a lot of people like to type peak, so peak it's 128 gigabytes per second. Uh, we have logic to support one hop scaling up to eight sockets. And we provide two PCI Express Gen 3 ports, each by eight in width, and finally, logic for power management. T5 includes a 28 nanometer port of the uh, S3 core originally in introduced uh, on T4, actually last year at Hot Chips. Um, T4 was a 40 nanometer part and was running at three gigahertz. Uh, just to refresh a little bit, so this is an out of order dual issue core it achieves its high frequency of 3.6 gigahertz with a 16-stage integer pipeline. It's dynamically threaded, offering great performance, running anywhere from one strand to eight strands per core. In single-strand mode, that strand has full access to all of the 
um, cores, functional units, and resources. And as you add strands to the core, um, they're fairly shared among the active strands. Unprecedented in the industry, uh, S3 accelerates 16 encryption algorithms and random number generation in pipe using instruction set architecture extensions. And the following table illustrates all of the algorithms that we accelerate. And, and the fact that it's in core and in the instruction set architecture uh, is particularly valuable in virtualized environments because it means that you can um, live migrate a virtual machine from one system to another, even if it's doing um, encryption, which tends to be happening more and more these days. OK, now I'd like to hand it over to Ram. Thank you, Sebastian. I'll be talking about the cache hierarchy components and the coherency subsystem on T5. Um, the core is leveraged from uh, the uh, previous design, which was talked at last year's hot chip. So I'll just briefly go over the core caches. Um, we have three levels of uh, cache hierarchy on T5. The L1 and L2 caches are private to a core. The L3 cache is shared by all the 16 cores in the design. Um, the L1 instruction and data cache are both 16 kilobytes, four-way set associative. The L1 data cache is right through. The L2 cache is a unified 128 kilobyte cache that is eight-way set associative um, and is also inclusive. And uh, it keeps the L1s coherent and maintains inclusivity by using a precise directory of the L1 tags. The L2, L3 interconnect is an eight by nine crosspath switch. The eight ports on the north side of the crossbar are used by the 16 uh, cores. And the nine ports on the south side of the crossbar are used by the eight address interleaved banks and an IO bridge. The crossbar network delivers a bisection bandwidth of nearly one terabyte per second. That's twice as much as uh, we had on T4. And uh, the interesting property of the crossbar is that in the L3 to L2 direction, it has two networks. It has a control network and a data network. The data network is used for returning line fill data. The control network leads the data network by five cycles, and it is used to return L3 tag compare results. I'll tell you where we use that <clears throat> to our advantage. The L3 cache is an eight megabyte cache. It's composed of eight one megabyte banks. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, it's 16-way set associative, and it's an inclusive cache. Um, the line size of the L3 is 64 bytes, and our interprocessor coherence protocol is MOSI. So each of those 64-byte lines is held in one of five MOSI states. If you focus your attention to the block diagram, um, I hope it's clear enough from the last row, but uh, the L3 receives L2 miss requests, L2 writebacks, L2 copybacks. It also receives interprocessor requests and DMA. These requests arbitrate for the L3 pipeline. And when a request wins arbitration, uh, it looks up the L3 tag array first. The results of the tag compare are then used to clock the data array. That's a power savings measure. Uh, but the results of the tag compare are also sent back to the core using the control network of the crossbar. Um, so uh, the core uses a tag hit to wake up a dependent instruction and align its issue with the return of data from the L3. That mitigates some of the latency impact of performing a serial tag followed by data access in the L3 pipeline. Um, and the core uses the L3 misinformation to conditionally flush the missing thread from its scheduling window. The scheduling window is a very precious resource, and you don't want to waste it on a long latency, uh, on a thread that's waiting for a long latency instruction. So um, it's used by the other threads uh, after the flush. Um, the L3 cache maintains all the uh, maintains coherency of the L2s, and it does so with a precise directory of all the L2 tags. And the directory is maintained in a structure called a reverse directory. And the reason it's called a reverse directory is because rather than saving the full physical tag of the L2 in the directory, we just save its L3 location by taking advantage of the property of inclusion. That's half as many bits, so it's about a 50% savings in area and power. We have some other features in the L3 cache that we added on T5. Um, L3 cache um, supports um, the allocation of a DMA buffer in the cache itself. And this can be uh, triggered by two different mechanisms. 
a device could set up cacheability on a per transaction basis, or um, a driver could set up cacheability on a range of addresses. Uh, the application for this is that in a message passing protocol, you could accelerate the message passing by allowing the producer to directly deposit the, ma uh, the, the message in the consumer's cache. And the consumer can then consume that message with a very high throughput because it's consuming it out of its cache rather than out of memory. Um, contended locks is a real problem for scaling multiprocessor systems. And uh, this is especially the case if you have multiple processors sharing a lock and multiple threads within each processor also contending for that lock. So you could very well have the situation where the lock just keeps bouncing around from one socket to another. And what you actually want to do is when a, uh, when a socket acquires an exclusive copy of a line, you want that socket to complete as many of its local thread requests as possible before relinquishing the ownership rights. So the T5L3 does that. And it does that by forming a linked list of same address requests in the L3. Um, and these are local requests from its local threads. Um, and when it receives an exclusive copy of a line for the oldest request, it completes all the requests in the chain atomically. So it reduces interprocessor traffic, and it helps getting past these contended log bottlenecks. Um, the T5L3 also has a, um, has a high availability feature that's called cache line retire. So if error handling software determines that a location in the L3 is a constant source of errors, it can purge that location coherently and then retire it from the allocation pool so it never gets used again. T4 scales up to four sockets and does so very well. With T5, we've extended that scaling up to eight sockets, as Sebastian mentioned. And we've done that with a glueless one-hop interconnect. Not only that, I'll show you a scaling performance slide later on. We've done that with near-perfect scaling. And in order to achieve this close to perfect scaling, we've provided a very high inter-socket bandwidth, a coherence fabric with a very high inter-socket bandwidth. Also, we've designed a coherence protocol that very efficiently uses this bandwidth. The coherence protocol is directory-based, and it precisely tracks all the L3 tags in the system. And it's striped across all available, L3, all available sockets based on the lower order bits of the L3 index. For example, in a two-socket system, all the even L3 indices are tracked by socket 0. All the odd L3 indices are tracked by socket 1. That same principle can be extended all the way up to eight sockets. <coughs> and uh, each socket maintains its directory partition in an on-chip SRAM, uh, which has a highly flexible configuration, because it needs to work in the two-socket space, and it needs to work all the way up to the eight-socket space, where it needs to be very associative. Um, and by our calculations, the, uh, uh, the um, directory-based protocol that we've designed is 50% more efficient than a traditional Snoopy protocol where an L3 miss snoops all the nodes in the system. Onto the coherence fabric. Each socket has seven links that connect it to the seven other sockets in an eight socket system. Each link is 14 lanes wide, and it can run up to 15 gigabits per second, which provides a very high inter-socket bandwidth of about close to 28 gigabytes per second. Um, and as we go to lower configurations with four sockets and two, two sockets, it's necessary to provide more inter-socket bandwidth in those configurations. And we can do that by just trunking links together. If you look at the figures, um, for a four socket T5, we can just trunk two links together. And for a two socket T5, we can trunk four links together to provide the higher inter-socket bandwidth that's needed in those configurations. And hardware supports a single lane failing over in any of these links without any software intervention. The protocol has some optimizations that we put in for scaling improvements. Uh, the protocol allows a speculative read of memory to happen in parallel with the coherency sign-off that happens at the directory. And in the case of a directory hit, the protocol always uh, enforces that one of the sharing caches return data, even if that data is clean. Um, we also have a feature called dynamic, uh, dynamic congestion avoidance. And I'll talk about it later, because I have a slide with some pictures and animations. Here's a slide that shows the internode transaction flow. 
There's a requesting node, uh, memory home. The memory home is a function of the address. And the directory home is also a function of the address. It's a function of the L3 index. And uh, the C to C slave node that's being shown in this figure is a sharer, is a sharing cache. So what I'm going to show with this transaction flow is a request that hits in the directory and gets data from the sharing cache or misses in the directory and gets data from memory. Those are mutually exclusive conditions, but I'm showing both of those in this graph. Uh, on an L3 miss, a node request is issued by the requester to the directory, and in parallel, a speculative read is issued to memory. On a directory hit, um, the direct coherence home sends a source data request to the C2C slave, which is the sharing node. And on a directory miss, it sends a serialized home read to the memory home. At the memory home, the speculative read and the home read are tied together, and data is returned to the requester. So the data comes either from memory or from cache in this figure. And having the speculative read of memory saves us 31% in uh, load to use latency. This is a slide that shows dynamic congestion avoidance. Um, so in an eight socket system, you have 28 gigabytes per second between any two sockets, about 28 gigabytes per second. But if you're running a workload where you're running that link with a very high utilization, you have the option of using a proxy node to send that same data message. So the um, figure shows that with an animation. The, data, the link between the data sourcing node and the re data requesting node is highly utilized. So we forward the data through an intermediate node. This is a slide that shows all the uh, peak bandwidths, I.O., memory, and coherence bandwidths. As you can see, the peak memory bandwidth of this system with DDR3-1066 is north of one terabyte per second. The coherency bisection bandwidth is less than 840 gigabytes per second. And the PCI Gen 3 bandwidth is 256 gigabytes per second. And here's a slide that shows our multiprocessor performance. On the x-axis is the socket count. On the y-axis is scaling. Um, as you can see, we have near-perfect scaling on OLTP. Um, the scaling factor is about 7.5 for an eight-socket system. Um, and OLTP is a highly shared workload. So when we did our measurements on that particular workload, 65% of the data is coming from another node, is coming from a remote node. So there's a lot of interprocessor traffic in that workload, and it's the most difficult one to scale, but it still scales fairly well. So at this point, I'll hand over the mic back to Sebastian. Thank you. Okay, um, I divide our power management advances into two categories. Uh, the, first, the first are a set of features that uh, act to save power when the, the chip and various functions in the chip are not at 100% utilization. And I've listed them out for you there. I'm only going to have time today to talk about uh, the first three, chip-wide DVFS, per-core pair cycle skipping, and CERTI's power scaling. Um, the second category that I'm going to talk about today are uh, power management features that kick in when peak performance is, is demanded. And those are features that achieve peak performance given kind of customer-imposed um, thermal and current power constraints. All of our power management uh, features are configured by uh, customers via Oracle's integrated lights out management software. And I've shown a screenshot there where the elastic policy has been selected. Uh, this is our recommended setting and really enables a lot of these, these features that intelligently detect when um, components are either idle and can be powered off or um, can have their power scaled back. So I'm going to talk about the hardware and software interaction um, in elastic mode for two specific features, uh, dynamic voltage frequency scaling and per-core pair cycle skipping. Just as a quick refresher, um, as to what DVFS brings to the table, I've um, included a graph here uh, with actual measured data from T5 that shows uh, relative power, processor power, on the y-axis versus um, frequency on the x-axis. 
And if you take a look at the curve, uh, if you fit, the exponent is approximately uh, 3, which makes sense because we know dynamic power is proportional to frequency times voltage squared, and to achieve higher frequencies, you need to increase the voltage. Um, additionally, we've seen that leakage uh, tends to increase as the cube of voltage, so the data makes sense there. Um, if you actually look at uh, th the point 3.6, that's showing a relative power of 1, you can see if you don't actually need that much performance, if you can drop the frequency back to 3 gigahertz, for example, you can save, it looks like, 40 percent um, power. So with that background, um, how does software make use of this feature? So what happens is there's a system-level power management software that interacts with the operating system, Solaris, um, via hypervisor layer. What happens is, actually, Solaris makes a frequency request for every core on the chip. So these frequency requests bubble up to the system power management software, and then it makes decisions to um, optimize the, the power efficiency point. So th the way it does that is pretty simple. It basically tries to find the um, lowest frequency that meets the requirements of all the cores, which is actually just the maximum of the requested core frequencies. And that works great when all the cores are doing the same thing, when they all request the same frequency. Um, but then you might ask, well, what happens when two cores request 3.6 gigahertz and the rest of the cores uh, are only requesting, let's say, 2 gigahertz? So we can still ach achieve power savings in that scenario using per core pair cycle skipping. So the way that works is that uh, the power management software forms a ratio, which is the requested frequency divided by the current uh, DVFS frequency, and then it rounds that to the uh, closest supported cycle skipping ratio, and we actually do cycle sk skipping in, in eighths. So there's a window of eight cycles, and you can programmatically um, skip any number of those eight cycles on a per core bear basis. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about another type of elastic power savings we do, and that's on our CERTES coherency links. So as Ron mentioned before, uh, in our smaller configurations, we trunk links to achieve more inter-node bandwidth. But it turns out you don't always need all of that bandwidth, so we put in hardware monitors on the link units that uh, have programmable high and low watermarks. And so if the utilization drops below um, the low watermark, we'll interrupt software that can then come in and offline uh, coherency links. And I have an animation in the left that shows that in process. So you can imagine a data center that goes from being highly utilized to being uh, less utilized. Maybe it's nighttime, and we can drop from four trunked links down to one link. When the load picks up, we'll bring those links back online, and that can continue indefinitely. We've measured uh, a power savings of 25 watts with this feature. Uh, similarly, on the memory links, we support two levels of power savings, uh, L0S, which is a um, light sleep, fast wake up, and then L1, which is a deep, deeper sleep where we turn off the links completely. I'd like to transition now and talk about uh, peak performance uh, thermal power management. So we've actually put in a feedback control system. This is all in hardware um, to manage thermals. And basically, we have four thermal diodes placed in the four quadrants of the chip centered in the core hotspots. And if any of these temperature center sensors uh, is reading a temperature above a high water mark, which is set based on um, reliability uh, limits, then we'll drop the frequency and voltage of the chip. Conversely, if all of the temperature sensors are below the low water mark, we'll bump up the frequency and voltage of the chip. So you can see that what this feedback control system acts to do is, at any moment in time, uh, push the frequency, push the performance uh, to the maximum level allowable in the, in the system. Uh, we have a similar uh, loop for current management. And I guess one thing that I'd add about that is we can actually not only regulate the VRM that supplies VDD for the processor, the, the core voltage, we can also um, manage subsystem or even system level power through the same interfaces. So that supports um, power, 
policies like um, power capping. We talked about elastic. We also have power capping where you want to set it to not exceed power. Okay, uh, PCI Express Gen 3 I.O. Just want to quickly touch on, you can look at this more offline, um, but we've put in enough hardware to ensure that uh, virtual machines um, have full access to SRIOV, so they have direct I.O. access. And let's see, there's another slide comparing our improvements from, from T4. Uh, just in conclusion, since I'm running out of time here, um, T5, it is our belief, will become the processor of choice for uh, running Oracle software because we think it uh, offers the best performance on Oracle applications, including the Oracle database, Oracle Fusion applications, and Oracle Fusion middleware. Thank you. can take a couple of questions. David Cantor, uh, what uh, VCC are you running at to hit 3.6 gigahertz? So we actually employ per part VDD. So the voltage uh, that we require for 3.6 gigahertz can vary um, from part to part. I think it's probably in the range of uh, maybe 0.95 to one, one volt, more or less. Thanks. I think you just answered my question, but you said each core has its own uh, voltage rail. Uh, no, there's one uh, supply for all of the cores. And then how is the software controlling, you were mentioning per core DVFS? Uh, it's actually chip-wide DVFS and per core pair cycle skipping. Ah, so okay. a pair of scores, we don't have, a, we have one common um, PLL for the chip, but um, on a core pair, basis, you can actually do cycle skipping, which is kind of like clock gating, sure. but for the whole um, unit. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, John Edmondson, NVIDIA. What's the lowest voltage that you run, lowest VDD? Um, actually, I don't think we've determined that yet. We're still in uh, post-silicon characterization. Last question. Yeah, Bill Rash, Intel. I have two quickly related questions. Um, the T5 uh, didn't show a integrated Ethernet controller like the T4 has. And at the beginning, you mentioned a special feature for low latency clustering to support Oracle engineered systems. And so I'm wondering what it is that does low latency clustering and if that's somehow related to uh, an Ethernet controller. Uh, the feature that we were talking about or alluding to then was the allocating DMA feature that I, that I talked about. Okay. And uh, what was your previous question? And then the, is there a 10 gigabit Ethernet controller on No, the there guy? is no 10 gigabit Ethernet controller. There control. is not. No. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank the speakers. Thank you. So now, the last talk of this session and the last talk of the conference. And you can now see why we have, you'll find out why we have called it a big iron session if you're Surprise, and, and you'll see. It's not one, two, three gigahertz. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep the suspense. So, and everything else you heard so far will look like a Wimpy core. So now Kevin Shum is currently tech, uh, senior technical staff member at IBM's uh, System and Technology Group. He received his bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering from Columbia. And uh, then he joined IBM Poughkeepsie Lab. And since then, he has been uh, architecting uh, a Z-series Z processor system, Z10. He led the design of Z-Next processor and is now working on a future microprocessor. He received IBM Corporate Award in 2009 and just this year received Asian American Engineer of the Year Award from the Chinese Institute of Engineers. So let's welcome Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep. Uh, good afternoon. Hopefully, uh, saving the best for last. And um, before I start, a little bit background. When I prepared the foils, we didn't realize, I didn't know that uh, we were planning to do it on the hardship as a debut, and then followed by announcement later. But of course, marketing and all that stuff changes. So for those who have catch up on the news today, or maybe you caught it up yesterday, 
Uh, we announced the mainframe yesterday, and it's called Z Enterprise EC12, or short named Z EC12. And the chip I'm presenting is the heart and, and guts of that mainframe. So that's a little background. Um, just be because of that, a lot of stuff in the presentation does not have numbers, um, because I can't put it in the chart. But feel free to ask me afterwards. But I warn you, I'm not a good number guy. I don't remember a lot of stuff. I just design stuff. Um, OK, here we go. Uh, highlight of the chip, 32 nanometers SOI technology. Uh, Scott Taylor went over this during the Power 7 Plus chip, so I'm not going to go over it too much. Uh, it allows us to build a uh, close to 600 millimeter square chip with 15 layers of metal, two more than Power 7 Plus, uh, about eight miles of wires, close to three billion transistor. I thought I'm going to have the most, but it looks like Spark beats me. Um, a lot of power IOs, about a thousand signals, they uh, have interconnects to the external hub chip, which is our, uh, what we call the SC chip, which have the L4 cache, um, and a lot of them connect together, uh, manage the coherency across the system. Another I.O. buses from the chip going out is for the external I.O. chips and memory controller going out to the memories. A little, cavi a little uh, extra thing in here that, uh, that I have a prefetching in there. In the memory controller, there is actually a prefetching function. You heard a lot about doing it in the L1, the L2. Uh, the memory controller actually knows to try to prefetch a little bit more than this ask, and then uh, park it in the L4. A uh, little bit more on the chip, six cores um, of this chip compared to the last generation, which are four. So that's two more. Uh, the coprocessor on the CP chip, uh, for those who are not familiar with our design, the coprocessor is synchronous with the core, is responsible for database compression uh, and uh, cryptographic functions. Um, so by not sharing it, which we did prior to this generation, we simplified test methodology. Uh, we also uh, improved its performance. The on-chip share L3 uh, doubled to 48 megabytes, all due to the benefits of embedded DRAM, as Scott had mentioned earlier. The rest of the pitch is going to focus on the core features. Um, the core overall itself is the second generation of all the core. I'll talk about the speed, frequency, feed, the pipeline changes, and some other microarchitectural innovations that I would like to touch on. Uh, there are a lot more stuff we change in this processor, but I can't talk about them all. I also will touch on two uh, interesting architecture extensions that's provided in this core. First one is hardware transactional memory. The second one is runtime instrumentation. Um, OK, a little background. Everybody have a chart to show the history. So I got to have one, too. Uh, this shows about the last decade of processors. Not showing a lot of feature features down at the bottom. I'm not going to go over it. For those that attended hard chips for prior generation, you have seen them. Uh, the thing here to show is a frequency increase from two, year 2000 from a C900 series. You can see we're riding the uh, technology curve. By Z10, two generations back, we did a deep repipelining. And uh, that's when we get to the 4.4 gigahertz. So we're going for the best. Uh, Sigma I6 take a little more technology advantage. So we went to 5.2 gigahertz and was then the fastest core that we know of. Um, and of course now, Z-Nix, 2012. Again, we ride technology a little bit, do some hard work. We're able to get to 5.5 gigahertz as a shipping frequency. Um, combining that, the other side of the chart in orange to show the transistor increase from the older generation to so what we have now. Um, you can see it's a nice curve, adding more and more stuff allowed by the technology. So technology plus design optimization that we did through the generations, what does it give us? It provides better performance, more capacity at the box level. We maintain unmatched reliability by doing um, high level of checking. We have instruction retry, uh, kind of produce you went over that. We have uh, cache deletes. We have processor recovery with processor relocation. So we got all kinds of stuff to make sure that the mainframe, the processor, runs almost forever. Um, 
running at this frequency, we don't have you know, temporary speed up or temporary speed down. This frequency is running all out 24-7. Why? Because our machine is sold to support customer workload that runs all the time, assuming they're running at peak capacity. Um, and all this we're doing is the same power constraints as prior generations. All right, a little bit about the feed now, after we talk about speed. Um, this is the second generation of all the design we try to improve on what we had on Z196. The first thing is, let's get more instruction down the pipe. Uh, we realized that because our instruction set is a lot more complicated than others, uh, we have more stuff that we need to break them into smaller instructions or micro ops. Uh, by doing that, we actually slow things down. So we, we, we changed that design. We were able to actually smoothly crack the instructions through a pipe without bubbles. So that's the first thing. Second one, we were limiting how many, what kind of instructions can be in a group, especially related to branches. If we see a branch, we're stopping grouping. The, that group of instructions is, is ended by the branch. We changed the design so that now we can take two branches. Uh, by doing that, you can more instructions go in the group, the more go into the pipe. Um, we also added an instruction queue at the decode stage so that when a clump of instructions deliver from the instruction fetching unit, after it get decoded, dispatched, if there's things left over, it can be regrouped with the next clump of instructions from instruction fetching. So in that way, we can send more instruction down more fruitly. Next thing, we want to increase our folder resource. Feeding more down is good, but we want to do more, right? So um, one limitation was our tracking logic, the global completion logic that tracks how many instructions are in flight was limiting how much we can send down. Um, and because of our architecture, again, there are a lot of instructions that are breaking the multi-groups of instructions. So we designed something that called early speculative completion. So if you get a five group uh, micro-op in the instruction like a low multiple registers, if the first group is done, we're going to preemptively assume it's done, even though the next two may not be able to finish. Um, if we find out the next group hit a access exception or something, we're just going to flush the pipe and do it again. So uh, that allows us to free up more resource earlier. Uh, we are actually able to increase the global completion table by 25%. In the meantime, we also added more GPR registers and floating point registers to increase all the possible resource we can increase. The next thing is, how do we get more instruction down uh, processed? After we get more resource, after we can send more instruction down, we, we need to process them faster. And branches are prominent in our workload. They're, I guess database transaction, there are a lot of if then else in there. So um, we added a, a branch queue, a virtual branch queue. Uh, we call it virtual because it's not really a unit in our design, but it's there. It's not, it's not like an invisible branch unit. You can see silicon on it. Um, it also have a branch, a queue feeding a unit. We added for that so that all the relative, uh, relative branches can be queued up in a separate queue and can be processed in a separate unit. By doing that, we can increase the issue queue size by 60% and increase our issue bandwidth from 5 to 7, which is 40% increase. Uh, a quick recap on the z 196 pipeline, which we base this design on. Uh, you know, you got deco, dispatch, uh, cracking, renames, wake up, Issue this, you know, issue and then processing. Um, not going to go over all the detail here, but just to show the delta, we do have to add the instruction queue cycle on the upper left in green. Uh, we added the virtual branch unit in green in the top uh, in the yellow box, and then we also added a, another cycle in the back for the um, increased depth of the GCT, so that we take an extra cycle to complete things. But all that adds up to better performance. That's good. Rather than, in addition to um, generic, you know, kind of ad hoc adding of stuff, we all get other things too. We realize there are a lot of instructions going through the, the, our workload that just setting register to zero, for example. So we say, why are we setting it to the FXU? Why don't we just rename it on the fly and then finish it off? So that's what we did. We find a few things that we can short circuit and um, so we don't have to send it down to the execution unit. The decache was always a bottleneck because there are a lot of fetch and stores going on. So we want to increase its capa uh, capability. 
And one thing we did was to change the SRAM design to support two reads and one write in its uh, uh, basic block design. It basically have 32 banks in the macro, which can support two reads and one write to different banks. And uh, if, you, if we detect a collision in the same bank between the write and the read, uh, we're just going to redo the, the, the write again. So this allows us to write things faster from, from store instructions, and we can do fetches in parallel. So it speeds up both um, uh, store hit load bypass that we cannot bypass, and also cache miss that come back and write back into the cache. We also added a dedicated point point. Uh, a fixed point divide engine to speed up its operation. Um, and then we have the more very complicated instructions, which we do in vertical microcodes, or millicode, as we call them. For this instruction, we pick the few that we think we can do in hardware. They're, they're complicated, but not too complicated. So instead of doing it through a, uh, a kind of like a branch to this vertical microcode and come back, we just do it all in hardware. And we picked the one that is uh, dominating our workload from our customers, like we call translate, translate and task, and store clock. Um, there are a lot of work that translate a, a certain format to another format using a table. Um, we also do there are a lot of, I guess a lot of the software like to keep track of their clock time too. Um, we increase startup latency for this MIDI code operations so we can get to it faster and get to, uh, like I said, it was kind of like a branch over to this subroutine. Um, so while speeding it up, we can able to get things going faster. There are also prefetching instruction added just for our, this firmware millico to use to help move data faster. Uh, as a transactional processing processor, uh, a lot of stuff that we do are just moving data. You know, I call it, we spend energy just moving data from one place to another. Uh, but that's what they do. Uh, we also added hardware to in the code processor to do Unicode conversion. Um, we find out that more and more workload that are done in other countries that we need to be able to support trans, you know, uh, converting one data format to another data format. So after that, we go, OK, what are the cool things we can do? I'm not going to go over this in detail. Uh, a lot of people in the prior talks that talk about fancy, the most innovative branch prediction they have um, inside our team, we call ours the Cadillac. Uh, some of the other designers actually envy the branch prediction team because they get so much real estate. But it's important when your pipeline is deep, uh, when you want to do all that work in time with the right instructions, uh, branch prediction is very important. So. We look at two things. One thing was we need to predict as fast as we can to get to the next instruction stream. And the second thing is we need to be able to capture as many branches as we can. So we did two things. One, we had a second level BTB, uh, actually have the target, full targets in it. So um, it has about 24 kilo in, uh, branches history in there to, to back up our BTB one. Um, so that's one. Second one is our BTV1 is also big, and our frequency is fast. So to look up BTV1 to find the next branch takes two to three cycles, three cycles, I think. Um, so we have this table that remember the last 64 branches. And if you're in a pseudo good size branch loop program, you remember all those 64 branches, and again, can feed kind of like you're here now, now you should go to this index, look for the next branch. If, if, so you don't have to wait for the result of your first lookup. And you can just jump right to the next one as fast as you can. By combining these two structures, we're able to do a, a prediction every two cycles. So that's a great improvement for us. Next one is cache of system. Branches are everywhere, that's one thing. But the other instructions that we have that, that happens in our workload is always loads and stores. Some of those looks like they don't really do a lot of you know, adds and subtracts. Um, cache is important. And data misses are also very important to be better at. So we decided to split the L2 into two, uh, from unified to dedicated. So by just physically moving them out and not combining them, allow us to cut the latency down. And also, we can increase the size of the L2. So in this case, 
the instruction L2 is one meg, the data L2 is one meg. Um, so, and then on top of that, we want even faster latency accessing the data L2. So what we did is we put the L2 directory inside the L1 directory together. By doing that together, by the time we miss the L1, we know exactly where to look for the data in L2. Um, so we, by doing that, we integrated that. We can actually get to reduce the L2 heat latency by 45%. I can give you a number because now we announced it's about six cycles. So think about that. One megabyte of data access in six cycles in our frequency. Um, the next thing is we have six cores, and they're doing pretty good. And we, but then we still have to do all this, like I said before. We have a lot of store instructions, too. All this store traffic going out to the shared L3 could be a problem. So we decided we're going to build this store gathering cache. It's made out of a circular queue, 64 queues with uh, half lines size. In our, our lines, is 256 bytes. Uh, so in this case, it's 128 byte queue. Um, it will merge your stores that are into the same half line, and they only evict when it fills up or certain events happen. By doing that, we can reduce the traffic to the L3, uh, and the L3 can smoothly support the six cores we have on chip. It also supports what we're going to, I'm going to talk more about the hardware transaction uh, memory support. Uh, a little graph on the side show you the statistics we did by doing a store gathering cache. We typically reduce the tra store traffic by about 50%, which works out good. The next one is a little dips and dabs on other architectural extension we provide so that our software team can make use of to get better performance. Uh, we provide a two gigabyte page support. Two gigabyte page is chosen because that fits naturally to our translation process. Uh, it also is, is a good size so that we can fit our Java heap and database buffer pool, which is our intended targets and other data structure that other application and middleware team can use of. Uh, we also added a decimal foreign point extension. Uh, we already had decimal foreign point back in Z10 in hardware. We make it pipelineable in CNY 96. So it's doing pretty well, and we want to go back and look at our legacy stuff. Our legacy stuff, especially with those workloads done in COBOL, they, um, they still have a lot of zone fixed point decimal data, which are SS format, or operated by SS format instructions. SS means storage to storage. Storage to storage is not great because you have a lot of cache interference, uh, just think of it, you have to add and then add again. You have to put the data in the cache and fill it back, fetch it back out. So this, allow, this instructions that allow us to convert those song data to decimal foreign point data. So we essentially convert uh, source to storage op to, to register or register ops. So by doing that, we, we see a great improvement in those uh, COBOL code. All they need to do is just recompile it with our COBOL compiler. Other direct uh, processing directive that we add uh, instruction to preload a branch into our branch target buffer, and also an instruction to tell us something about the intention of a certain uh, cache access or operand access. By doing that, we can, we can see if the data they touch is going to be used next uh, for storing, we'll fetch it with the right coherency state rather than guessing. Or uh, they can tell us that I'm going to use it once, so don't put it in a, real, uh, you know, a really good LRU position. Those are examples of what we can use with this instruction. Um, then we go into more differentiation items. What can the system on its own get better by doing joint software and hardware collaboration? Um, last year, I think Bujin Q team talked to you about transaction memory or transaction. Transition execution is what we taught. Um, their design is on a chip basis. Our support is general purpose. It go across the whole system, across all the processor cores. It, um, it allows the, the software to, to specify a transaction, and then uh, we'll handle the recovery when they are bought. There's a special concept in there called constraint transaction. It, if you fit a certain criteria, the hardware will retry for you to simplify programming uh, headaches to do with uh, transactions. 
uh, a little graph at the bottom to show you a, a benchmark we did that, you know, m many calls trying to go and update a, a linked list, a circular linked list. You can see at the bottom yellow is without transactional support. The top blue line is with transactional support. You can see that, you know, the curve ran faster, it's better performance. So it's, it, it shows that we achieve what we want to do with the hardware. Next one is runtime instrumentation. Uh, we want to provide more flexibility to our software team to do more work for performance. In this case, this is a joint uh, invention with the Java team. Uh, they, want, they, they want to have a hardware backed up way of profiling a runtime program uh, in real time. So we did that. Uh, we provide a way for them to specify a region of, of code they want to profile. We will track uh, branches, for example, taking branches across the code in a, in a buffer, and then we can report the taken branch as a taken branch trace. Uh, we can report GPR values. We can report things or that you know, we have missed on this cache or, or missed cache on this level or this instruction. So we provide different kinds of information back to the, uh, the JIT environment. And by doing that, they should be able to utilize this information to better tune their code. Uh, this is still in development from the code side, so we don't have much to show. Summary, uh, I said CNX will actually, I should say CNX is, because I told you it announced yesterday. It's in the new family of System C mainframe servers, which is called CEC12. It, it is going to sustain IBM's leadership in computing capacity uh, and performance without sacrificing any reliability. We have up to six cores, 48 megabytes of on-chip L3 cache, low latency private L2, gigantic branch prediction history support, and other numerous microarchitectural enhancements. It will be the first general purpose processor to support transactional memory, uh, self-directed runtime profiling, and we think it's the fastest microprocessor beating even our prior generation at 5.5 gigahertz. Ending the, the, the presentation here, I still have to thank, thank you for my microarchitecture design verification team. Our team go across the earth from many different labs. The one that I highlight here is a, the major part of it. Also, the joint discussions with the architecture software performance research teams are very variable. And of course, we need support from our project management and technical executives. Thank you. OK. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Patrick from Bill <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Looking at the uh, die layout, the uh, accelerators on the die, you have them assigned to each core. And if I look at the total amount of die area in the accelerators, they, they actually appear to use about as much die area as the uh, L3 cache on the die. So the, the performance benefit of all those accelerators is, I'm kind of curious about the trade-off between the benefit of those accelerators versus the die area that maybe I misunderstood how much die area they occupy. Uh, well, first, uh, actually, the picture I have in this chart is not a die. It's actually a design box. Um, the accelerator... I don't know, can we go back there? The, the, the coprocessor is actually pretty small. OK. Um, we, we, we used to share it because of convenience. Now that we dedicated it um, to speed up our, our test methodology so that the coprocessor you know, can be by co you know, coordinated with the processor itself, it also allows to speed up its startup and ending. OK, okay that makes sense. That's why I yeah. asked. It it's it's so not big. It, it's like a tiny piece in the okay. middle of the, the core of the And then a, a couple, oh, another really quick question is, yep. what is the instruction decode width? How many instructions per clock? And the instruction retire rate? We can decode rate. three. We can dispatch three. We can issue up to seven. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, com we can uh, complete three. These complete are complete three. Yes. OK, thank you. Yep. All, obviously, all these are up to. Depends on what they are. David Cantor, uh, what's the if so? If you have a six-cycle latency on your L2 cache, what is the latency on your L1? Uh, four, three. Well, the <laughs> 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 I, I always have to remember uh, a looping case will be four-cycle. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, more questions? Looks like just one last question from Kunle. Kunle Alukotin, Stanford University. So what is the size of the uh, transactional state you can have in your hardware transactional memory? The um, fetch footprint is limited by the L2 size, so it's about one megabyte. Give or take a little bit depends on our design. Uh, there's some caveats in there that it's probably too detailed to discuss. The store bandwidth is uh, limited by the store cache, so that's 64 by half lines, 120, 64 times 128 bytes. Thanks. Yep. Okay, so everything you read in architecture textbooks, you saw it in here, right? And there's many more that he couldn't talk about. So That's let's right. thank the speaker. And that. Well, folks, um, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of the uh, program committee for putting together uh, and evaluating all these presentations. I hope uh, you enjoyed them as, as much as I did, uh, including the tutorials on day one. Um, I think we had a very uh, high quality uh, content. I, I hope you guys uh, uh, share that. Um, one additional mention is that there were several presentations that ended up being updated somewhat in uh, a real time. Uh, some of the keynotes didn't make it onto the distributed material. It'll all go online in, in a handful of days. Uh, and uh, email will go out to all the registers attendees with, uh, I think it's a, a web log on, and you can then download the, the, the latest material. Um, ju just one more thing, if, if, if you had as much interest in some of these presentations as I did, one thing I personally would like to request you is talk, you know, if, if you didn't uh, submit anything yourself, consider doing that in a future year. Uh, if you have colleagues that are gun shy, tell them what you experience here, because I sometimes see this in my own colleagues at Intel that it's a lot of effort to get past marketing and get the whole thing going, and you know, you have a day job, I'm sure you all know that. Uh, so, but it's, it's very rewarding to, uh, you know, socialize and, and, and share ideas with uh, people that work in this industry. So, uh, thanks a lot. So, uh, Christos or Jan, you have other comments? Yeah. So, uh, a few general remarks. Uh, first of all, evaluation forms. We pointed it out a few times. Uh, we changed location, especially this year, filled them out and dropped them off, uh, off at the registration desk. Uh, Rumi just mentioned the presentations. They will be online. Uh, also the videos, we try to get them online, let's say two weeks from now. They will be password protected, but you will get an email uh, with the password in there. Uh, so as you may know, we, we have an organizing committee uh, we have a program committee. I think they did a great job, but most of the work the last four days has been done by an, uh, an army of volunteers uh, headed by Gary, and I, I think they did a great job. I mean, I was a little bit tired this morning after a, a keynote that stopped at roughly 9 o'clock being here at 8.30, but those people have been here for the last four days, sometimes at 8 o'clock in the morning, and then cleaning up till 10 o'clock at night, so I really appreciate that. Also for the organizing committee, the move complicated things a little bit. Uh, this is especially to, for two people. I mean, Lens, for example, you don't see him, but he's sitting backstage taking care of all the audio and video and all the wires running through the building. I think, considering the move, uh, it's a really smooth transition. And the same goes for uh, John Sell. Like every year, he does the, uh, the food, the catering, he provides you with lunch, dinner, and I guess most importantly, with, uh, with ice cream, uh, and also that, I think, uh, okay, so, so I get an applause for the ice cream for John, okay, I'm sure he appreciates that. M more ice cream next year? Yeah? Okay. Um, so I'd also like to, uh, to thank the, uh, the people here at Flint who make us, uh, made us feel uh, at, at home. And um, again, thanks for being here, especially uh, the speakers, I mean, without you, there wouldn't be a conference. Like Rumi said, next year, sign up, submit something. It's really appreciated. And I hope to see you next year at Hot Chips uh, 25. That's it.